One of the things I've noticed is that when things go well, it's the investors, it's the equity side that gets all of the upside. Absolutely. When things go badly, yeah, the equity takes the hit, but that's also when the banks end up being exposed. Can we come up with something a bit different that allows the banks to have some of the upside as well? So if things are performing well, I don't know, you make some overpayments, you share that upside with your banks to help reduce their exposure rather than expecting the banks to sit there with no upside forever and ever and ever to just make sure that risk balance is maybe a bit better. So maybe we need to think a little bit wider than traditional plain vanilla project finance. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. This episode is the first in a series on global project finance organised in partnership with SMBC Group. With four episodes covering Europe, Australia, Asia and the US, this series is hosted by Aurora with guests from SMBC, various law firms and Aurora. Welcome to Energy Unplugged. I'm Anna Maria, head of Iberia at Aurora. We have a very special episode today. I am joined not by one guest or by two, but by three. So let me start by introducing them. So first we have Caroline Litton, Managing Director, Head of Power and Renewables, Global Structure Finance, EMEA for SMBC. Caroline started in project finance in 2003 um, as an analyst working through all of the financial models and spreadsheets used at the bank and has worked on her way up. Um, She has always been focused on infrastructure, um, 12 years uh, actually in oil and gas, and three years ago she was asked to head up the SNBC Power and Renewables business. She has a physics degree, so gets generally very excited about all the science. Caroline, welcome. Thanks very much, Anna. It's really, really, really my pleasure to be here today. We have uh, John Dewar, uh, who is a partner at Millbank London. Um, He has lots of experience in the sector and with Millbank, which has one of the largest renewable practices in the world. He became a partner in the late 90s and has worked in a series of IPP projects in the UK and in Europe. He has lived the energy transition, having worked on coal power plants, but also now in renewable energy, including one of the early portfolio financings with PowerGen Renewable Energy. At Millbank, John works on renewable energy projects, but also on the hydrogen space and in the EV and battery space. Welcome, John. Thanks very much, Anna. It's a great pleasure to be here and looking forward to our conversation. And then we also have Casimir Lawrence. He's a principal at Aurora. He leads the renewable energy practice of Aurora's consulting team for continental Europe and has been active in the energy uh, sector for the last kind of 10 years. Before joining Aurora four years ago, he did a PhD in energy economics, which was then followed by a postdoc at the German Institute for Economic Research, focusing on policy consulting. In the last four years at Aurora, he has advised investors, utilities, banks, and developers on various transactions, financings, and strategies in other various European power markets. So, Casimir, welcome. Thanks, Anna. Also looking very much forward to our discussion. So, one of the the first things, given the wealth of expertise um, in the the group here that I wanted to to get into, um, is just how you see um, the level of activity in project finance space uh, at the moment. Um, So Caroline, why don't we start with you? Uh, What are you seeing in the market? I think overall there's huge levels of activity um, on an ongoing basis. On a country by country basis, everything sort of goes in fits and starts, shaped around maybe some of the renewable subsidy auctions or other stabilization auctions and things like that, that people might have to bid into an auction to wait to see what their project looks like before they can go for financing. And in other countries that have moved away from subsidies, more consistent, but we still have this really dynamic mix of new build um, through these sort of government procurement programs, as well as a lot of M&A activity. There's a lot of assets changing hands as well. So huge amounts of activity. Um, and that's in mostly in the renewables space. Um, you mentioned hydrogen a bit in the introduction. I'll leave that to talk to John a little bit, maybe. <laughs> Fits and starts, there's a lot of talk. 
I think hydrogen is so much talk at the moment and it's really started really exciting to to see when things are actually going to come to fruition um, and people are going to get to financial close and start building things. Yeah, that's right, Anna. I think uh, Caroline is absolutely spot on in terms of market activity. Um, you know, we're seeing a huge number of new entrants coming into the market, you know, particularly fund investors who are actually, you know, wanting to take much more risk than they ever have done and are getting involved in greenfield projects in, in various markets. Um, and, you know, this is a tremendously exciting time for the energy transition. Um, we, we were all at uh, COP26 last year and we're all heading for COP27 uh, this year in uh, Sharm El Sheikh. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a huge focus on, you know, not just the, the typical renewable projects, but, but also, as Caroline mentioned, hydrogen, uh, hydrogen to ammonia, hydrogen to uh, green steel, et cetera. And, you know, obviously a number of um, companies looking at uh, the uses of hydrogen in the domestic context and, and in the automotive context as well. Uh, because as we transition, we're going to have to deploy a huge number of different solutions to get to net zero. And so these new technologies are going to you know, have to work together. And, you know, I think one of the main challenges that we face is, uh, you know, joining all the dots together, particularly uh, from a regulatory perspective and making sure that governments and the private sector see eye to eye on how this transition is going to take place. Absolutely. Um, Casimir, from the Aurora side, you know, uh, you, do you share the, the experience in terms of the, the type of transactions that you're seeing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think one thing to add from my end, what, what I also found quite, quite interesting over the last years was the fact that we have, we have seen uh, uh, a lot of transaction happening on like asset specific levels, especially in, in the renewable space, sometimes going for portfolios. But what was really the, the big big thing in the last years, from my perspective, was really the fact that investment funds going really for developers and going at this, this even earlier stage, such they can uh, get these projects at a start, reduce transaction costs because they've worked together with them. And that's, of course, also very interesting transactions uh, also in our perspective, because much more complicated to see what's the, the capabilities of a developer than what is the risk of an uh, maybe even constructed wind offshore farm. No, absolutely. The the value does seem to be shifting kind of earlier in that in that value chain of renewable development, doesn't it? Um, so you mentioned um obviously the shift into renewables and, and some other technologies like electric vehicles and, and hydrogen. So so John, where do you see the biggest areas of, of debate or of negotiation, uh, particularly around new technologies? Yeah, I think uh, new technologies obviously bring challenges, uh, particularly for lenders. You know, the equity side is often willing to take the risk, but uh, lenders only see downside from new technologies. So as these uh, technologies are, are, are sort of brought into the market, uh, particularly on the hydrogen side, um, where, where I think, you know, there's still financing to be closed. You know, we haven't really seen anything major in that area. Um, lenders are going to be particularly focused on, on the technology issues, you know, whether it's uh, in hydrogen to ammonia or into the green steel sector, where it's important that we decarbonize the, the steel sector across the world. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that's going to lead to uh, quite a, a big focus because traditionally, you know, lenders have been, uh, you know, have run away from technology risk. And yet, you know, we see it in spades in a number of these sectors. So, so I think that's that's going to be a major challenge. Um, I think there are also some regulatory issues that uh, governments need to grapple with. Um, I think in the, uh, for example, in the traditional renewable space, uh, there's a real issue with you know transmission uh, in in the sector, and you know we're seeing huge challenges in the UK, for example, with you know lack of uh, of uh, transmission. Uh, capability both at the distribution level and at the national grid level and that plays out across many countries and so governments are going to have to really focus if they're serious about net zero on you know how do we develop the uh, transmission and distribution systems to allow this you know huge seismic shift towards renewable energy. It's great to build all these wind farms and solar parks and things but if your grid can't take it and it can't have all, handle that level of intermittency versus peak demand, 
then you haven't really got a story there. You also missed floating offshore wind, oh, yes. another another technical <laughs> battle that has has started in France and I think is is going to carry on um, as that scales up. And certainly from the bank side, um, everyone's really interested in learning about the construction issues there, potential yeah. maintenance issues, um, and all those all those sorts of things as well. So I think there's plenty of new technology coming. Um, even things like battery storage is not hugely well understood in the finance market yet. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of those things to come. Absolutely. I was actually going to talk about battery, but battery storage kind of later on, but actually it seems like a perfect place to, to bring it up now. Um, so, you know, again, in, in, in this context, uh, Aurora sees a, a major role for storage uh, kind of going forward across kind of all European um, kind of energy markets. Uh, but as you say, um, lenders have traditionally been um, you know, pretty reluctant for, for, you know, a number of reasons to, to lend to this project. So um, I guess, you know, how do you, Caroline, how do you get lenders and the respective credit teams uh, to feel comfortable uh, with what is invariable higher shares of merchant risk on these assets? I think part of it is thinking about what kind of financing you're going to use, because traditional project finance works really, really well where you have a long term offtake contract, normally with a fixed price. And that's kind of what project finance is designed to handle. And over the years, it's being flexed and it's being bent and it's being pushed around a bit. And so far, the industry's flexed pretty well and kept up as much as we can. Mm -hmm. But when you get to something like batteries, the stability of revenue isn't really guaranteed by any one entity. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you can get capacity market contracts if you're a battery, but they might be quite short term. And so does that mean is project finance the right sort of debt to put against a battery where the upside potential is huge, but it's through arbitrage of pricing. It's a really different revenue model. Is, pro is long term non-recourse project finance still the right thing to put against that or do we as bankers and lawyers need to get smarter about what kind of finance structure we're using and come up with something that fits that merchant side better and one of the things that I think about a lot and although as you said in the introduction I've been in project finance for ages one of the things I've noticed is that when things go well it's the investors it's the equity side that gets all of the upside Absolutely. when things go badly yeah the equity takes the hit but that's also when the banks end up being exposed can we come up with something a bit different that allows the banks to have some of the upside as well so if things are performing well i don't know you make some overpayments you share that upside um, with your banks to help reduce their exposure um, rather than expecting the banks to sit there with no upside forever and ever and ever um, to just make sure that risk balance is is maybe a bit better. So maybe we need to think a little bit wider than traditional plain vanilla project finance. And, and why do you think that hasn't happened yet? What's the barrier to make? I mean, that makes perfect sense to me. But why why do you think that hasn't happened yet? Frankly, personal opinion, because people are still signing the checks. Um, people are still saying, oh, I should support this strategically, so I will take the risk. And maybe people will take the risk on a few projects or small projects and maybe in their home markets. But if these things are going to scale up, you need every bank in the market to be happy with that risk at scale. And I think maybe that's some of it that we just haven't got to large scale on some of these things yet. Yeah, I think that's right, Caroline. I mean, we, we've seen some battery um financings done in in association with other plants you know peaking gas plants sometime with renewable plants and some of those deals have, have worked but the batteries are relatively small scale so they're not a big part of the overall economics um, I think you know as part of this energy transition that there's going to be a need to deploy you know battery sets of you know hundreds of megawatts to, to make it all work and and that's where I think uh, you know, the government can't just leave it to the private sector to figure it out. You know, they need to come up with some regulatory um, framework, which uh, perhaps would be more aligned with the way that the transmission and distribution system is, is worked at the moment. So that's another area that could be considered. And, and, and we know that, um, you know, these this sort of infrastructure can be, you know, financed if, um, if you know, there's, there's the correct risk reward balance being deployed by, 
um, governments and by you know uh, transmission companies etc and we've seen that work but obviously it's a completely different model to project finance it's more of a regulated asset base structure and finance based off that so i, I think there'll be uh, some focus um, in in government circles on whether you know there's a need to uh, deploy battery technology in that way um, I, I think on a smaller scale, it's still possible to do, you know, uh, project finance type deals as long as the battery is not a significant part of the economics. But, but of course, we need to encourage, you know, giga battery um, projects uh, to, 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 to encourage this market evolution that uh, we all desperately need. I think those joining the dots type projects are really important. I think... Um that possibly is where some of the solution is rather than keeping doing everything as a standalone. Um, and actually the first hydrogen project that we financed and that we've seen financed is solar plus batteries plus hydrogen. So within a kind of closed system, almost in French Guyana, counts on the European episode of this podcast because technically in France, um, <laughs> they oversize their solar. Um, and so during the day they run off solar and they charge their batteries and they run a hydrogen electrolyzer. So you get a few more hours of electricity from the batteries when the sun goes down. And then once your batteries are depleted, you can repower from your hydrogen to get you through the night. And that turns into something really interesting because you've taken the intermittent solar resource and turned it into a steady electricity supply. So I think for me personally, those joining the dots projects where you take away some of those risks that you might get in a standalone project um, is actually you know, a really interesting thing to say. See, really interesting thing to see. Yeah, and, and we've been seeing a, a fair amount uh, of that as well, for example, in Iberia, where a lot of kind of co-location projects are emerging as a way of protecting against PPA risk, for example, uh, if you sign a, a base of PPA. Uh, Etc. But Casimir, I have a question um, for you. So, um, you know, kind of John was was talking about kind of contracted revenue streams uh, effectively. Um, how do you see those uh, evolving uh, across Europe? Yeah, yeah, I think that that's indeed the key point to to getting probably also project finance into into that space, because at the moment when we're looking at batteries, there's the the advantages uh, so that you are mostly active on several markets. So you're not, not exposed only to the spot market or to selling the electricity on the spot market, like with renewables, but you can be active on different balancing markets. For example, you can still be active on the spot market. You can, you can uh, um, enter capacity markets. And in, in, of course, these markets are small and fragmented and different in every country, which is of course great for us to provide uh, intelligence on it. But um, at the same time, it gives you um, diversity uh, with regards to the potential revenue streams. Um, nevertheless, what I said in the beginning is these markets are still very small and, and volatile due to the fact that small capacity changes, so compared to where we're looking on, on renewables, can change the full market. It's, it's something that we have seen, for example, in Germany with regards to the so-called primary reserves, uh, so short-term balancing reserves. Um, very high prices in, in with a very short time, a lot of batteries entered and the market collapsed and a lot of people burned their fingers on this. Um, so it's, it's also a bit of a dangerous market. And if the government wants uh, to, to have a sustainable development of these batteries, I think there would be the need for, for some kind of uh, regulated revenues um, that can be through capacity markets if there are the, the right revenue structures there. Um, but there can also be other interesting models, for example, really enforcing this co-location, which, which uh, both of you have also touched upon, because I also believe this is, this is bringing this even to the next level. And there are subsidy schemes where co-location is, is incentivized. And why do I believe um, not only from a system perspective, co-location is very interesting, but also from an investment perspective, because many times, uh, if it's a good market for renewables, um, it might not be the best for batteries uh, and vice versa. Same with electrolyzers. Of course, if you have very low capture prices, so the prices that the renewables can, can get are very low, that's of course not so good for the renewables, but good for the electrolyzers. So uh, by having this um, portfolio effect, you can, you can diversify, um, but fully understand that this is probably very hard to take into account when, when doing some project finance and, and speaking with the risk departments about these portfolio effects. So I guess we don't get around, and, and to come back to your, your original question, Anna, of, of having some regulated revenues. And there are developments in different markets happening in that direction. 
Okay, excellent. Now we've talked about kind of the the market and the reg, the regul the market regulation side of things and the market uh, economics and and revenue streams. But um, you know, in the case of batteries, um, warranties and expected battery performance is also kind of a key point uh, of negotiation. So, so John, from the from the legal side, um, is there anything that you would simplify in the contracting process around those aspects of of battery development? Yeah, I think that's a that's a good question. Um, uh, I think yeah, currently we're spending a lot of time negotiating around those those warranties and performance parameters, etc. And I, I, I think that uh, that's partly because you know uh, the technology is relatively new, and it's uh, you know perhaps the first time that certain lenders have been looking you know long and hard at uh, at how to finance um, these types of project. Um, so I don't think there's any particular silver bullet that can be deployed to shorten those um, negotiations. But I think over time, what will happen is that uh, the, the market standards will evolve and, you know, both suppliers and developers and lenders will, you know, coalesce around what, what is what are acceptable uh, warranty parameters. And, and that's when, you know, you'll start to see uh, standardization uh, evolving, but I think it's going to be another, you know, couple of years before that uh, happens. And you know, um, I think um, you know that there are stresses in the market in relation to batteries, uh, which uh, uh, which are, are certainly very evident. Um, not just the supply chain issues that we face generally, but but also um, you know raw materials, etc., and uh, access to to raw materials. So. Um, I think uh, you know that that to me in the battery space is is the the main stress point at the moment. Um, you know, there's a lot of people you know scrambling to um, access uh, the the metals from very challenging countries, and uh, you know we're finding that uh, contractors are uh, you know challenged in terms of being able to make you know longer term commitments, particularly you know in scaled up projects. Um, so if you're talking about, you know, 800 megawatt battery projects, which, you know, uh, we're looking at one of the moment, um, you know, one of the major issues is, is not just, you know, uh, negotiating around the warranties and performance parameters, but, um, you know, how do you deal with uh, accessing the raw materials for a project that will take, you know, several years to deploy. So those are the main issues that I see around the battery area at the moment. Yeah, and I think it's a stat I actually learned from Aurora. Um, that I think you guys have said before that there's not enough lithium in the world based on current known resources to actually achieve the scale of batteries, kind of battery storage and EV batteries that is anticipated or is needed. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's something I think about quite a lot. And that supply of raw materials is absolutely critical. Yeah, which is why indeed other technologies will need to be deployed. You know, we'll need to be using hydrogen in our vehicles as well as um, charging them you know, from the from the grid system. So I think we're going to we will probably see the development of hybrid um, models that, that deploy a variety of renewable energy sources. Uh, I don't think the, the automotive manufacturers are quite focused on, on that yet. They tend to be focused purely on the EV side without thinking about, you know, hybrid vehicles. Uh, but I think, again, you know, um, there'll need to be some joining up of the dots um, across the world to make sure that we don't sort of sort of uh, we, we share the battery minerals fairly and and we, we develop the technologies that will enable us all to drive um, cars that are that are environmentally friendly yeah and, and we, we are seeing I guess some some battery manufacturers um, already looking at different chemistries, for example, right, where, you know, traditionally the in the in the trade off of kind of cost benefits, kind of lithium has come on top. But obviously, if there are supply uh, issues, if there's cost issues with lithium, then uh, some new chemistries then start to make it into the mix. Just a quick interruption before you listen to the rest of the episode. If you enjoy our conversations with key energy leaders and decision makers from around the world and you'd like to meet them in person, then join the Aurora Spring Forum 2022 on Thursday the 14th of July in Oxford, UK. 
The topic is delivering the energy transition in a fractured world, navigating price volatility, geopolitical risk and supply chain disruption. The speaker lineup includes the Right Honourable Kwasi Kwarteng, the UK Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, Ben Van Burden, the Chief Executive Officer of Shell, Nora Mead Brownell, former Commissioner of FERC and former Chair of PG&E, Miguel Stilwell Dandrade, CEO EDP and EDP Renewables, and many more. Spaces are limited and they're filling up quickly, so book your ticket now. For more details, check auroraer.com slash events slash spring hyphen forum. There's obviously another another important topic so I, I might come back and touch a little bit on, on the supply chain issues that we discussed but I wanted to start a little bit um, before with um, kind of interest rates and the impact of, of high interest rates uh, on the market so in her speech last week um, Lagarde anticipated and I quote a gradual but sustained path of further increases in interest rates now, after two decades of kind of zero or even negative interest rates, obviously that is a game changer, um, which is, of course, compounding the effect of supply chains that we've been um, discussing a little bit. So I guess to, to start on that, on that note, Caroline, what does a higher inflation and higher cost environment, I guess, do to the typical project finance terms? I think... Obviously, it has a knock on effect on banks because it means our costs of funding are higher. And so we need to charge a bit more money for our money. But actually, I don't think that's the biggest impact in there. To me, the real big impact is on equipment prices. And the one that stands out right now is wind turbines. Um, Because of the lead times on the contracts, we've seen as the prices of raw materials and um, those sorts of things and labor rise in the last few months, we've seen the major European wind turbine manufacturers post some pretty nasty looking financials because they're still having to provide those turbines at prices that were agreed three or four years ago. And actually, I think that is much bigger in terms of worrying about a bank, whether a bank charges you 1% margin or 2% margin. Um, abstract numbers Um, because without wind turbines that can be provided on you know a realistic cost basis that means that the turbine suppliers are not going to go bankrupt we don't have anything to lend money to and it's something that's been bugging me for a little while as we've seen everything tighten in the industry everything particularly the government procurement processes has been a race to the bottom in terms of squeeze the prices, squeeze the equity returns. And we know so many of the developers have been like saying this for a few years now that the returns, you know, they tipped into single digits a while ago and they're still going down and it's being pushed onto the banks as well. It make your funding cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And on one hand, that's been good because it's a lower cost to the end consumer of this electricity. But as this sort of, readjustment and bounce has shown it's not viable in the long term i think these projects and the costs associated with them have to be priced fairly for everyone you can get a long way in an industry by renewables by it being the right thing to do people will invest to off to maybe offset some other emissions or as part of a portfolio but as it grows as a standalone industry it's got to stay appealing investors have got to be able to make a return doesn't have to be huge, but there's got to be one. Banks have to make just a bit of a return. The turbine suppliers and other contractors and equipment providers, and there's loads of them. I've spoken mostly about turbines, but there's a whole host of other parties involved in these things, including construction companies and all sorts. Everybody has to make enough money to survive. And that's really important that we figure out as an industry what the actual cost of this is, of this wonderful capacity build outs. And maybe it's not ever going to be as cheap again as it has been in the last couple of years. I think maybe we've seen the bottom of the market and we need to think quite honestly about fair value as well as lowest cost. 
And and you know, to, to your point, Caroline, we and we touched on this um when we first started. Um, you know, there will be a need for investment in transmission and distribution, uh, at the very least, right? And that's a cost, and that's a cost that consumers uh have to bear. And so, you know, we when we think about the energy transition and the cost of the energy energy transition is not just the megawatt hours uh, and the cost of that is the whole infrastructure that can support that uh, that needs to be invested um, in so so I think you're right I think we need to be honest about the the true cost of this energy transition yeah and Anna just building on what uh, Caroline said I mean we've seen real stresses on deals you know particularly ones that are heading towards financial close you know with people having to change their EPC contractors where we're seeing a shift away from, you know, uh, the European dominated market towards Asia, Asian manufacturers, and uh, particularly the Chinese seem to be breaking into the market big time. And again, that's causing stresses amongst uh, both equity and debt providers, because, uh, you know, no one knows who these contractors are, they haven't dealt with them in the European context. There's a, there's a concern about uh, security concern about uh, uh, adopting any form of Chinese technology, almost paranoia about Chinese technology. So that's causing some stresses. But in, as Caroline said, in this, in this you know, low price environment we're in, people are, are having to find you know, the lowest cost solutions to deliver these projects. And um, we, you know, we're involved in a number of situations where people are, are flipping contractors to deal with the stresses. Um, and we're also, you know, after financial close, we're seeing a number of projects where disputes have arisen between developers and the contractors, you know, who are who are pushing hard because, as Caroline said, they're financially distressed. They've got their balance sheets are in in a mess. And they need to raise every change order they can find, and, and and they're being aggressive about it. So we have got into some, you know, semi litigious situations, you know, where these tensions are coming out, and that's just symptomatic of a of a system that's uh, looking slightly broken uh, and needs to be fixed. And here we are, you know, against the backdrop of you know escalating oil prices and oil prices 110, 120, and we're sort of ferreting around at the bottom, trying to pull these projects together at very low costs. Um, so there seems to be a bit of a disconnect in, in in the energy markets, where you know hydrocarbons are attracting high prices and developers and lenders to renewable projects are struggling to get the deals done. So there's 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 a bit of a disconnect here. I think that's what's right. What's going to be really interesting to see is the outcome of the UK CFD round that's going on over this summer um, and what assumptions people have put in with their bids. Because if people have bid with like an old turbine cost from a year or two ago and then get awarded their CFD, is that project going to be deliverable? If they bid with today's turbine cost, are they going to look too expensive and will they be awarded the capacity? So I think that's going to be really, really interesting to, to see where that CFD round comes out. And I agree. And, and, and even even if you do take into account those higher costs, and we saw that in, in some recent auctions in where, you know, only six months ago, the results of solar auctions, for example, uh, were very different to the ones that, that we saw in, in October. So the February versus October comparison is quite striking. Now, a big portion of that was just cost, the capex cost. Um, but even with that increase, we still see a massive discount to merchant prices, to your point, uh, John. So it's not just oil. If you look at wholesale markets for electricity, they're incredibly high uh, at the moment. Um, which brings me to, to the next point, um, Casimir. So um, obviously, there's been a fairly kind of big um, kind of move towards merchant risk uh, from renewable projects in different ways. You know, part of it is just the tail end uh, of a project because contracts are shorter um, than they used to be. But also, um, in some cases, the need to not or, or the desire to not contract the full amount of the project, whether it's PPAs or auctions, but to leave some exposure to, to merchant risk to benefit from that um, upside. So in that context, what do you see as the biggest uncertainty in power markets at the moment? I, I think it's it's quite uh, obvious that at the moment it's the gas price. Um, I think we have been all surprised by no means uh, what happened to the gas price even before before the Russian war in Ukraine. That was already exploding and um, the impacts were visible in, in, in whole, whole of Europe at least. Um, therefore, I think in the short run, 
gas price is really the, the main driver of uncertainty and the question, when will we get back uh, to more normal levels? And the second question is, of course, what is a normal level? Uh, for Europe, um, we, we were used to extremely low gas prices. I personally believe we don't get to these levels anymore, which also has big impacts on, on industry in Germany and, and, and further points, but we'll probably uh, stabilize at a level uh, above what we have seen, but clearly not at these extremely high price levels that we're seeing at the moment. Um, uh, but going forward, um, when, when we have overcome this, this short-run energy crisis, there, there are still uncertainties, of course, in the market. And gas will will be one of the biggest ones. Um, we will see kind of a bit of a, a phase out of gas uh, price uncertainty and phase in of hydrogen uncertainty. Of course, the question is there: um, how quickly will we reach uh, net zero targets and so forth, and how quickly will we will be able to phase out gas out of our um, electricity mix? And that's in in the end also a very country specific question. Um, Globally, I think gas will play a very long, a big role uh, in, in the electricity sectors longer than it might play a big role in, in Europe. But hydrogen prices will, will be the next uncertainty. Um, but I think it's, it's not only the commodities, and that's, that's very important, especially when looking on renewables. Um, the, the largest risk also for renewables is uh, other renewables, so to say. And what we like to say, the cannibalization of uh, uh, prices is due to the fact that when more renewables will be built, um, my own renewable asset has, has less value because uh, we all produce um, often at the same time and therefore prices are lower. And I think this connects also to, to the questions and discussions we had already before. What are the risks and what is driving the amount of renewable build out that can be the market itself, that can be uh, market dynamics, uh, price levels in, uh, and so forth. But one big driver is still government. Uh, governments deciding for build out targets, governments deciding uh, to, to abolish uh, um, support that has a major impact and also large uncertainty. So I still believe that regulatory uncertainties, unfortunately, unfortunately, still a very big uncertainty in the market and making it also harder to to estimate what are the right capture prices in the long run. And yeah, if if this is something that we could reduce by having uh, uh, like a longer perspective within governments and so forth, I think this would potentially also or hopefully make a project finance on more merchant projects more possible because you have a better, better visibility in the future. John, Caroline, do, does that marry well with what you've seen from, from your respective teams, particularly Caroline with your credit teams, I guess, in terms of what the biggest um, kind of perceived and, and real risks are in the market, of course? I think the perception of risk has changed quite a lot in the last two years because um, previously it had been everything was relatively stable in the European electricity markets. You could have a look backwards for five to 10 years and get a relatively good estimation of where you thought your lowest acceptable price was. And then COVID hit. And the power prices, certainly in the UK and Germany, plummeted to consistently their lowest in a really long time. And mm. all of a sudden, everyone's like, oh, so examining, thinking about a break-even price for a project at 25 to 28 pounds was no longer enough. You now had to stress test down to 20 because we knew it could happen. And now it's swung completely the other way and we're more like 120. Um, and no one quite knows what to make of it anymore. And the easy thing to do as a bank is say, this is really, really volatile. I don't want to take that risk. Um, or, and this is kind of what I said earlier, I don't want to take that risk unless I'm getting given something in exchange for it. And the ask at the moment, the mentality is still on this sort of rush to the bottom where, you know, make people take merchant risk, but equity gets all of the upside. So it can be quite challenging to find a way to finance merchant risk. It, some, some banks will do it maybe mostly in their home markets at quite small scale. Um, but it's quite challenging to see why you take want to take you know, that volatility and price risk on effectively someone else's market where someone else is benefiting from your money. Um, so I think there's a lot of sensitivity around it at the moment and a lot of desire. We see a lot of desire to monetize projects that maybe don't have those 25 year PPAs with a government or they don't have um, 20 year CFDs or whatever, um, but we've got to monetize them the right way. And I think we need to be a bit smarter about it. And 
just trying to continue to apply the same terms and conditions to the loan that you have under full subsidy for the really long term isn't the same. And I think, and I say this with my oil and gas banker hat on, we've got a lot to learn from other markets. The interesting one, and Aurora will have seen this because of the work you do on the gas side. When I started out in oil and gas 15 years ago, the LNG market was dominated by long-term SPAs, fixed price, not a lot of price reopeners, absolutely. And people were project financing on this left, right and centre, particularly in Qatar, loads of it. Um, And then over the time I was in oil and gas, that market changed completely to short term contracts and the introduction of the LNG spot market. And the market adapted. And most importantly for me, the terms of the debt changed. Tenors got a little bit shorter, pricing Mm -hmm. got a bit higher, coverage ratios got a little bit higher to take account of that risk and give banks a bit more elbow room. And I think, I mean, you can't yet, I hope that someday in the future we can, move electricity around the world quite as easily as you can move a tanker of LNG. But that market did it. That market went from fully long-term contracted Mm -hmm. to a blend of short-term contracts and spot. And I really think we should be looking at that market and seeing how those deals evolved, how their financing process changed and what we can learn from that in the electricity market because it's a really similar transition. That's fascinating. Um, John, from from your perspective, so, you know, all of this, the, the transition that we're talking about, the volatility uh, that Caroline was describing as well in terms of, you know, kind of the, the heights of COVID to kind of the, where they should say the lows of, of, of COVID in terms of prices to the highs that we're seeing now. Um, that volatility, has that changed people's perceptions in terms of contractual risk and, and like focus areas when it comes to kind of project finance contracts or even their approach to project finance contracting more generally? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. I, I mean, you know, to be honest, and it, the, the project finance world is one of the most detailed focused, uh, you know, worlds that you can ever be in. You know, I always have uh, c- comparative analyses with, my, with our leverage finance team who, who uh, you know, very covenant light in comparison. So uh, I think in terms of the, 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 the way we do our financing, you know, covenants, defaults, all that sort of stuff, we're not going to see massive changes in the market because, you know, PF bankers uh, do tend to, you know, want to know about everything that's going on in a project. They want detailed information, et cetera. And uh, they want, you know, uh, early hair triggers to get people around the table. So all of that stuff is already embedded in the model. Um, but I but I think, um, you know, I think it'll be more not so much the terms and conditions of project financings that get changed. It'll it'll be more the, the commercial terms that that will be adjusted. And we're not just talking about you know interest rates and margins and things like that. But as you know, we move perhaps towards uh, more of a merchant model. You know, we're going to see uh, you know perhaps more of the uh, as Carol, Caroline alluded to more of the market risk type um, structures that we see in oil and gas and mining projects, for example, um, to, to deal with merchant risk. Um, you know, I think there's still a, a you know, in certain institutions, a, a bit of a, a fear of, of merchant power, you know, which goes back to the, 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 the early merchant deals in the UK, which all had to be restructured or went into bankruptcy, you know, had had huge issues. And then we've had issues in the Turkish market, for example, with, you know, merchant power and, you know, the negative spark spread, etc. So there's, there's some um, huge caution, I would say, amongst uh, most bankers and, and even developers about, uh, you know, merchant power. So it has to be structured very carefully. Um, so, so I think it'll be those, those key commercial parameters that, that uh, need to move in terms of the project model. So I think we're going to see, um, you know, leverage ratios uh, going down, i.e. more equity or or shareholder loans in in the structures. Uh, As Caroline alluded to, we're going to see more cash sweeps uh, so that lenders can get upside, you know, when the the prices are high in the market uh, and more risk sharing. And then I think, um, you know, on the sort of project side, um, it'll be interesting to see um, how we deal with all these tensions uh, in the supply mark, supplier market and the EPC market and whether there's going to be more sort of partnering sort of arrangements between developers and contractors 
you know, to, to try and deliver the infrastructure that's needed in a, in a way that balances out the risks between, you know, those faced by the suppliers who are under immense distress and, and the developers who, who obviously have their own issues. So, so I think we will see some interesting models evolving, uh, but it's going to take time before, you know, they become sort of widespread. Uh, and in the meantime, for bankers and lawyers and uh, and advisors like yourself, we're going to, you know, be living in some very interesting times, as to quote the Chinese, uh, where we try to figure out all these all these uh, tangential issues and and pull the threads together. So fascinating times for us at the moment, Anna. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now, there's just one more thing um, that I wanted to to bring up because obviously we've been talking about merchant um, kind of risk, uh, and that's interesting, but sovereign risk. Um, is definitely alive and well uh, in the in the power sector at the moment. So you know, there's been uh, some recent Spanish policies around kind of clawback, uh, kind of mechanisms about capping the the price of gas that's used in the wholesale markets. Other countries like the UK have been talking about a clawback uh, tax. You know, countries that have traditionally not kind of gone too far into into this market interventions. Um, and I guess the question is, how do you think about managing this kind of regulatory and policy risk uh, in the power sector from a project finance perspective? And that's a question to, to all three of you, really. Um, Caroline? I think, I think it's really it's really difficult because there are some markets that have really good natural resources for renewables in particular, but also have a history of intervention. And governments need to think really, really carefully about this, because the more times they go back and tinker with this market, the more it puts people off investing, um, particularly what well, I was going to say from a subsidy point of view, because that traditionally has been the government's lever to play with. We saw it in Spain um, you know, around the time of the financial crisis. We're seeing it in France going on at the moment. We've seen discussions about it in other places. Um, so I was going to say, oh, you know, you go down the PPA route instead and avoid the subsidies. But actually, in September, the Spanish government proved that they weren't immune from That's that right. either. And they went and hit any developer who was writing their own PPAs um, with some more uh, legislation, ostensibly temporary, but um, we'll see. It makes it very, very difficult to want to put your money into a country that has too much of a record of interference. Um, you really want, there's nothing wrong with revisiting your regimes and changing them for future projects, but going back and tinkering with contracts you've already awarded. I mean, I'm going to hand over to John in a second for the legal perspective on that, but from a banking perspective, it's horrible. You go into something, particularly if you're doing project finance, you've got like money out for 20, 25 years on the assumption that someone is gonna stand by their word and stand by their contract. And for them to rock up, particularly when it's a government and just be like, oh no, I changed my mind. It, it doesn't make you want to give them more money in short. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I, you know, I think this sovereign risk that you're, you've identified is, is, is gonna become an increasingly big problem because uh, you know, all economies, even in Europe and the States, et cetera, are facing immense, you know, socioeconomic challenges. And we've seen a, a, a significant shift towards perhaps, you know, what people might call leftist uh, politics. Even the Conservative Party in uh, the UK is now being accused of uh, having become Blairite, uh, which uh, I think is filling them with dread, but it's, it's probably true. Uh, and th that sort of, sort of move towards populist um, politics, I think, uh, could impact on, you know, the, the business that, that we do uh, and get people more concerned about, uh, you know, uh, taxation rises, for example. There was even speculation in the press recently about, you know, uh, uh, excess profit taxes that could impact not only oil companies, but uh, renewable energy producers who are making money in the power market. So, you know that 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 was quite a, a shocking headline to read uh, the other day, um, and you know the and from a contractual perspective, there's there's actually very little that uh, both developers and lenders can do because if the law changes, it changes, and you just have to to live with it. But as Caroline said, um, it does impact on 
uh, everybody's views on future investment. So all governments, whether it's in Spain or UK or elsewhere, need to be very cognizant of the impact they have on the views of investors and lenders and take that into account before they, they make uh, policy changes that they, they may live to regret. Absolutely. And, and Casimir, I mean, from, from your perspective as a, as a market advisor, I guess, how, how, how do you tackle something like, you know, regulatory or policy risk? Yeah, yeah, I think, first of all, I would fully agree to the to state, uh, last statement of John that uh, in the end, a government making such a step to reduce costs, maybe in the short run, should really be aware that they're actually increasing costs in the long run because risk premium will, will be increased. And, and that's a typical discussion that we very often have that investors ask for these questions and investors are very like careful there, of course, because these clawbacks can, can, be, can be very big. I think uh, another point that goes even a bit beyond that would be with regards not only to uh, retroactively changing tariffs, which, which is indeed very, very dangerous, but we also see that kind of a discussion even going forward that there is limited trust in, in these electricity markets where you don't have, for example, a capacity market. And that's the question, will governments uh, allow uh, electricity prices of 10,000 euros per megawatt hour? For example, in Germany, they're saying, yes, they will do it, but let's see how a politician will react in that moment and connecting it to the discussions about batteries that we had before if you price that into your business model uh, you have to price it of course at a very high risk premium because you cannot believe that these prices will sustain and i guess this is especially something really dangerous uh due to the fact that if we if you don't want a capacity market from a policy perspective uh, to to build up that trust, I believe it's it's nearly impossible because you you can't build up trust for a politician that comes I don't know ten years after after you, and this will end up to people not building new gas power plants or not building new hydrogen ready power plants to, to put it into perspective. And therefore, yeah, I guess these these retroactive clawbacks are very very bad for investors' perspective, but also this uncertainty about how regulation will play out. Um, with regards to um, peak pricing, I think this will be a very big discussion in the countries of across the world that don't have a capacity market yet or don't have like a price ceiling. And yeah, I think this this will be a very interesting discussion, at least in Germany in the next half a year, a year when we'll be talking about capacity markets as well. Absolutely. And I'm clearly preaching to the choir here. But, you know, the, the um, market interventions also suffer from the fact that these are very complex markets with a number of players. And Despite the best will of, of regulators and frankly, the most competent uh, kind of policymakers, it's, it's basically impossible to, to completely predict how these things will play out. Uh, again, I've been living this um, kind of on, a, on an hourly basis in the last kind of couple of days. But the cap on gas in Spain, for example, has resulted in prices that, you know, not everything is, is the same. You have higher demand, you have lower wind generation, but effectively higher prices for consumers than before the, the cap. So um, again, it's just really hard to get these things right. I think we should um, leave it there. It's been a fascinating um, kind of discussion. Um, Casimir, John, Caroline, thank you so much uh, for joining me. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, thanks, Anna. Thank you very much. That was Anna Barrias, head of Iberia at Aurora, talking to Caroline Litton, managing director, head of Power and Renewables, Global Structured Finance, EMEA at SMBC, John Dewar, partner at Millbank London, and Casimir Lorenz, principal at Aurora. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.